Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Sean Colosmo, welcome to Haven Rock, uh, here in person and online. Definitely grateful to have you here today to be able to worship God together. We have some good news to share. Uh, Michael's uh, football team won another playoff game this past Friday. And we're a big time, but we're back from a recruiting trip to Tennessee. Oh. Right? So they'll have a matchup next week against Thompson. Be there or be square. It'll be Friday? All right, we'll get more details out, but that's something encouraging. You can talk to them about afterwards. I don't know about you, but I've been thoroughly enjoying learning more about the book of James, how God has been teaching us through it. Yes. I encourage you to go back and listen to lessons if you've missed one along the way. It's kind of like a story that we've been building over the course of you know, a good little bit of time. Uh, Brian Burrow got the honor of preaching out in Mississippi for the Mississippi Church today. Let's give him a round of applause. Tosin and Toya, you know Toya, that's her stomping grounds out there in Mississippi, so they went back to encourage as well. They are worshiping out there today, so prayers and thoughts are with them on their travel, and a great opportunity for us to connect with our brothers and sisters. Amen. So you're stuck with me. We'll see if we can make this work out all right, all right? Uh, so we're going to be getting into the last piece of chapter 4, and then we're going to go a little bit into chapter 5 of James, and then next week will be the grand finale. All right, we're going to finish up uh, chapter 5 here with James and then go on to where the Spirit's leading us next. So let's go ahead and go, go to God in prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for this time together. I uh, thank you for an opportunity to just speak your word. And we just pray that your word resonates deep in our hearts and minds. That your word <laughs> unfolds light before us, determines our steps, guides our paths, guides our relationships. God's our choices yes. to draw us nearer to you and to each other. Let your Holy Spirit move powerfully. Yes. Father, move me out of the way. Give me the analogies and the things that I need to say from my own life. Amen. Father, be with us in the spirit and the fellowship afterwards. Uh, Father, be with us in our singing. We thank you so much for how you've been there already today. Yes. Uh, we, Father, we want to bring you glory right here and right now. Amen. Help us do that with a humble heart and a humble mind ready to receive your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, like I was talking about, you know, we've been uh, trying to consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. Has anybody else really had some plot twists since we've been doing this series? Anybody else had some plot twists in life? Yeah, all right, see, don't be shy, raise your hand. It's been interesting. You know, after we started doing this series and the first lesson of it, I was sick for about a month. I've never been sick that long in my life. Right? And then that led into uh, family, uh, like health problems in my back and my body. Then we had some family problems. And then the biggest plot twist, because it was really new, I had some house plot twists. So we had a plumbing problem. One day, the hot water was running. Daughter just got out of there and she said, Dad, I can't turn off the hot water. Problem! <laughs> right? Work's on hold, everything's on hold, life stops, we got the hot water running. What do we do? We call all the plumbers, can't get a hold of anybody until finally somebody we get a hold of, right? We're like, we can't turn off the water. Look, see, it's running, right? We need help with this. They're like, okay, yeah, but there's also, this doesn't look right over here. Let's do a moisture reading in the wall. Oh, that could be mold in the wall. Oh, no. Oh, no. USAA is getting my call, right? Insurance, here we come. So God had to guide me through just that whole navigating because, you know, adjusters think you're trying to get over them, and then maybe the salespeople are trying to get more than they need to, and you're just kind of caught in the middle trying to say, look, I just want help. Can you stop my hot water and get the bad mold out the wood? That's all I want, right? And so you're trying to talk to all these people, navigate all these situations, and my blood pressure was rising. I had to do some repenting. You know, it was just all kinds of problems were hitting. God was just showing me a soft spot in my faith. He was like, you need to develop a little bit here. Because I got you. Right? I'm trying to help you mature, Sean. You know? Because it's not like things get on pause with your family and get on pause at work when you got another problem that happens, right? And so what they had to do is they had, we were like an airport hangar for like a week and a half. We had nine different machines in our house trying to dry our wood. Wow. So we step in a home and you hear, 
That's all you heard all day long. And I was good for about the first three or four days. I'm just like, we'll get through it. It's temporary. Keep my eyes on the prize. We'll get through this. <laughs> day five, I started going insane. I'm just like, stop. Stop. And, you know, India was giving up after like the first five hours. She's like, make it stop. <laughs> So pretty soon, she's like, make it stop. And then I'm running to the people, make it stop. <laughs> take these things out. I don't care if we got more. We've been living here for 10 years already. Just take the stuff out of the house. Just stop the noise. <laughs> so anyway, we, we got a lot of growth over the last two years yes. doing this series. So I, I, you know, I just encourage you to hold on to the wild ride because it's not just on, us on a wild ride. I know you've been on a wild ride too. It's been your own wild ride, whether it's been health, family, relationships, we're just trying to hang on there and not just hang on, but really hold and build our faith in God. Right. right? And so let's get over to James. We're going to talk about James chapter 4 here in a minute. If you have a device or a Bible, get over to verse 13. This is the target of the theme we've been going to. Real faith produces genuine stability. See, I can't look for stability in coming home to a peaceful home. <laughs> right? I, can't, I just can't. There's no guarantee that that's going to happen, right? I can't look for stability in my wife because she's battling her own journey in faith, right? She shouldn't look for stability in me. I shouldn't look for stability in what my kids are or are not doing. Because if you've been around kids, you know that they're like this. Right? I shouldn't look for stability in my job. But why would I look for stability in my job? If you've been working for a little while, you know you shouldn't be looking for stability in your job. Right? You know that, right? So where should I look for stability? In God. I got and that's what he was telling these people in James. Remember, they were oppressed. They were scattered. They were going their life topsy-turvy, upside down. They couldn't look to anything for stability except for Jesus. Amen. Right? And that is what it comes back to for all of us all the time. How soon we get there is our growing in the grace. Right? right. Growing in the grace of realizing that. So we're over here. I have a picture here, James 4, 13. And then we're going to go through 5, 6. You see my guy right there? That's how I believed in life for a long time. I'm just going to grab life. I'm going to hold it over my head and slam it down and show who's boss. Yeah. Right? That's kind of what this picture projects. I'm strong. I handle life. Right? I'm going to choose what I do, and I'm going to do it well, and I'm going to do it my way. Doesn't sound right, does it? It's because it's not, and you felt that way too to some degree. <laughs> Tell on yourself a little bit. Yeah. All right, so boasting about tomorrow is a little subtitle here. James chapter 4, right off the heels of humbling ourselves before the Lord so that we can have better relationships and understand how our selfish motives destroy the fellowship, mm. right? Humbling ourselves before the Lord, submitting to him and resisting the devil. Eventually it goes and passes into, now listen, you who say. Remember, he's talking to the brothers and sisters here. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Mm -hmm. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Right. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Doesn't feel like that, does it? I don't know about you, but sometimes my days and weeks are long and hard. It didn't feel like a mist. But I got to trust God's perspective on that. Right? God says it is. Right? Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Okay. Now listen, you rich people. We've been well because the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Doesn't sound good. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived in, on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. That's intense, isn't it? Yes. 
Man, that's intense. You know, started off, now listen, then he goes to a different crowd and he tells them, now listen. Yeah. Right? So we're going to break this down in two sections and see how this applies. But I don't know about you, but this whole thing about tomorrow and thinking about tomorrow can get a little bit confusing for me. Yeah. Right? Because I like to have a plan. Right. I really like to have a plan. You know, the, you know, barely after being able to run around the backyard, I decided that, look, I'm going to get to the NFL. If I can't get to the NFL, I'm going to go to the NBA. If I can't get to the NBA, I'm going to go to Major League Baseball. <laughs> None of those happen. <laughs> right? But I had a plan, didn't I? I had a plan, right? And as I progressed through life, my plans may have changed, but man, my desire to do what I wanted to do never really changed, right? right. Until I met Jesus. Come on. And he started really teaching me how my life was his life now. Yeah. Right. right? And there's a learning curve with all that. Come on, that's true. There is a learning curve. And so when we see in the Bible, even Proverbs, it talks about do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. That's right. That's right. You ever heard that saying, be where your feet are? Yeah. Be where your feet are planted. Right. Like live in the moment, be present and engaged in the moment. I don't know about you, but I can get so fixated on the future that I miss so many opportunities right in front of me. Yeah. Relationally. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right? I miss out on giving to my wife and giving to my daughter and giving to the people that are right there in front of me because I'm either planning the future or I'm worrying about the future. Right. You know, Jesus gave us some words about that. He said, do not worry about tomorrow. Right. All right? Each day has enough evil of its own. But you know, God's not against planning. He's not against us being diligent and being responsible and planning ahead. What he's really challenging is our motive behind our plans. Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of plans are they? Are they to bring God glory? Or are they to bring you glory? Are they to bring God glory? Or is it to make your life more comfortable? Right. right? I don't know about you, but I mean, I got some plans for comfort. Yes. <laughs> I work hard for my two hours on Saturday. <laughs> Give me my two hours. Sit down by myself. Right? Can I get a break? But what we see here is that God wants us to look differently at the future. Right? He wants us to look at it through a lens of if it is the Lord's will. You know, there's another proverb in Proverbs 16, 9. It says, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Good thing to think about, right? You know, we can do a lot of thinking and planning, but it's the Lord that's going to close and open the doors, as Andy was praying before. That's right. right? That's the Spirit speaking to us already, giving us a headway, a foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about here. Yeah. Right? And how important that is, that, you know, even our best thinking right. is not, you know, our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Amen. Right. Right. So our best laid plans, we shouldn't have a whole lot of pride to them. That's right. We, you know, uh, what I like to think about is, you know, have a dream, make a plan, but don't hold so tightly to it. That's right. Yeah. Allow God the opportunity. Because if you look over the course of the people in the Bible, you realize how indirect their paths are to fulfilling a promise from God. Right. That's right. I mean, if we could sit down and talk to David now, when they told him he'd be king when he was 17, and then 13 years after that when he was running for his life, you think he might have some things to share with us? Yeah. <laughs> or when Joseph had his dream and vision and then he was sold away to slavery by his brothers and then he was falsely accused and in prison and he had all this indirect route to where he was going. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But here we go again. That's that same theme we talked about at the beginning of James. Is I want my life to be neat, clean, efficient, and well organized. That's right. mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want it to be messy, back and forth, in a circle, not knowing where I'm going, walking by faith, right. not by sight. Mm -hmm. Anybody else struggle with that? Yes. Uh -huh. Right? So here we are. We're, we're in here in the grip of it, and it really comes back to something very simple. Most things always come back to something simple. It's not like I need to learn something fantastic every Sunday. I really just need to get back to the basics of the most important things. On, on most days, not even on Sundays. Right. Right? Here's the thing. James 15, if it's the Lord's will. Mm -hmm. Not just saying it because we're religious. Right. Yeah. That's true. 
but like needing it that, hey, if it's the Lord's will, this is what I plan to do. Right. Because it, it recognizes the surrender and dependence right. on God for all the things that can come along. Yeah. If it's the Lord's will, I'll finish this doctoral program. Mm. Right. As of right now, I just know I'm supposed to be in it. <laughs> and suffering from all the work. Right? In it. It's the Lord's will whether I finish it or not. Right? But when we come and take it a step further, it's just important to know that this theme was very common for Jesus. And that's, you know, you can see how it reflected in James. You know, everybody remember uh, the Our Father prayer? Yeah. You know, talking about high school football, I, I, they probably still do it now. It, every team I ever coached on, played on, you said the Our Father uh, who art in heaven prayer before and after the game. Yeah. At least after the game. Even though during the game, you weren't quite acting like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you really let these words digest, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you know, that might change some of the language on the playing field. Some of the motives that are down there, right? Some of the interactions between each other that happen, right? Right? But, but you know, Jesus talked about that and talked about in this collective aspect, us really focusing on surrender before God to his will. Makes sense, doesn't it? And I saw this picture over here and it really resonated with me. The prayer that shakes heaven. Lord, not my will be done, but yours That's right. will be done in my life. Really resonated with me because in chapter 5, which we'll get to next week, you see the power of praying for God's will in Elijah when he prays for it to stop raining and it does. Right. And that wasn't a selfish focused prayer. That was a prayer in line with God's will. Right? And it started making me really think how powerful that is to God when we say something with that level of surrender. Mm -hmm. Because it reminds him of the sacrifice and when Jesus did that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's flawed and ugly and stained with all of well, us, right? Mm -hmm. But how powerful that is, how that makes God feel when we're surrendered like that. Mm -hmm. To be willing to do his will over our will. And it's so much more what I've learned about that is that's not a one-time decision, is it? No. You say, Jesus is Lord. I said, Jesus is Lord, and went into the waters of baptism on March 19th of 2000. That's almost 24 years ago. Wow. Right? When I made that statement, I had a 30,000-foot view of what that meant. I needed to quit partying like I was partying. I needed to quit treating women inappropriately. I needed to quit doing all these big picture things, right? And I needed to go share my faith. That's about what I had. Come on. But then I started having a family, having a career, having all these other things, having chronic health problems. Started having all these other things come in my life where doing God's will created new meaning for me. Right. And, I, and surrendering in new ways. Surrendering to things I didn't have the time to do anymore. Surrendering to the circumstances of my life right here and right now. As long as my heart was humble before God. That's right. Y'all staying with me? Yes. Yes. Just checking, just checking, just checking. But verse 17, that, that really hits me also. Yes. You know, how can it not hit you, right? Because it's like, in America, this is like, you know, in American Christianity, this is one of those more respectable sins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if anyone who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, like, our society doesn't really judge people for the good they, they know they ought to do. Yeah. Right? They do a lot more about what you do. Right? You did something wrong. Yeah. How dare you do that wrong? Yeah. Right? Respectable sins in American Christianity are like, you know, just still being an immature Christian after 10, 15 years. It's just okay to be immature. Mm, well. Right? It's just okay, I guess. Well, it's not okay to God, right? Mm. But when we talk about this, about thinking about the good we know we ought to do, you know, I asked Coral, I was like, Coral, what, is, what comes to your mind when you think of this? She's like, I should share my faith. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So let me ask you a question that I don't want the answer for. I want you to reflect on. What is the good you know you're supposed to be doing right now? What is the Holy Spirit constantly pressing on your heart 
that you should be doing right now that you're not doing and ask yourself a question, why haven't you done it? I mean, I know the answer to that, so do you, right? I, I don't because I'm rebelling against God. Right. I, when I don't do the good I'm supposed to do, I'm doing it my way. Yeah. Right? I'm doing it on my time, my way. Yeah. But the whole point being is, it's, not a, it's never about us doing the right thing all the time because we can't. Right. That's not the conversation we're having here. Mm-hmm. Remember, throughout the book of James, we're talking about how God uses grace to teach us, right? Right. So we're right now in the situations we're in, and it's not just about, hey, don't go do this wrong thing you know is against God. Mm. It's also about how is the spirit moving on your heart for God to do a good work? Come on. Mm. And are you doing that? Mm. Because I have a really hard time just sitting around and not doing the wrong thing. Like, I just don't function well. (laughs) I eventually do something wrong. Right. Right? I kind of compound my situation. I can't just sit around and say, hey, I'm not going to lust, or I'm not going to be prideful. Or I'm not going to be. You know what I need to do? I need to do something proactive and go and love somebody. Yes. Right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Go spend time with God. Go spend time with God's people. Share my faith. Right. Build a relationship. Reach out to others. Like, I need to do something proactive on that side. But it's important for us to remember that how God looks at sin and how we look at sin is very different. So God looks at our congregation. Of course, he's concerned if we're going astray. Right. Right? Of course, he's concerned if you're doing something that he doesn't want you to be doing because of the relationship. But you know what he's also concerned about? He's concerned about the good he's putting on your heart to do. That's not getting done. So, you know, God unpacked this a little bit more for me, and we're not going to go there, but something you can read on your own time is the parable of the gold bags. You know, when a a man, you know, representing Jesus, gave uh, each to his own ability. He gave one man five bags of gold or talents, and the other man two, and then one he gave one. Then he left and he came back. And the five, they had five more to give back to Jesus. The two had two more to give back to Jesus. But the one, he just buried it. And he made all these excuses as to why he didn't do anything with what God had given him. And it really made me think about the previous verse. And it's like, what is God's perspective when he gives us resources and we stick it and we don't just don't do anything with it. We bury it in the ground. And then God says, his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. That's intense, isn't it? Yes, it is. And that's real. That's God's word. Right? Now, the other two, when you read this, you'll be inspired because whether it was five or two, he was like, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear, isn't it? But we can't just sit on our gifts. Amen? Amen. Do the good that God is moving in you to do because his spirit will do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, now we move on and we get into James chapter 5 and when you look at James 5, boy, I tell you, you know, he's talking about the rich who oppress others, right? Mm. And there's a long series or lesson that you can do about this. But when you look at this and you think the perspective of the people in James who were scattered and oppressed, mm-hmm. you think they might have had some strong feelings towards their rich oppressors? Yes. I'm thinking they did. I'm thinking they had some real strong feelings about how that made their life harder every day because of the things we read in this passage. The wages that weren't fulfilled. The people that were murdered that were innocent. All these harsh things that were happening in society around them. They couldn't look around and look for stability in society. And I hope you're not looking for that either. Because it doesn't matter what country you live in, you shouldn't be looking to the country for stability. Right? 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 But all these hard things that are happening in James really epitomize in this picture right here where you have the wealthy throwing this wealth around and using it as they pleased. Right? Turn over to Psalm 73 for me. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of get mixed on this passage, you know. Uh, I get mixed feelings on this passage because I'd like to think that deep down I have faith that God's judgment in the end will take care of anything it needs to take care of. Right. Yeah. right? I'd like to think that I have that type of faith that, look, people are going to get away with stuff. People are going to do things that are wrong. Look, I know I did a lot of things that are wrong that I didn't. Right? right? I'm hoping I can look at that with humility in a sense that, God, I hope, you know, in the end, if you see fit for anybody to see any kind of consequence, I know that you'll fulfill that. Right. Right? right? But, you know, sometimes I really get caught up and I get struggled with envy. Yes. Anybody else get a little envious of people they see that seem to have carefree lives? Yes. Yeah. Man, don't have to go work the nine to five. Don't have to have such a crazy schedule. Yes. You know, the bills aren't as much a concern. Future plans aren't as much a concern. It's just like, you know what, man, I just wish all these things were taken off my plate. Yeah. Life was easy. Easy. Yeah. Right? Well, you and I are not alone. Those of you that said that you struggle with this. Uh, Asaph wrote a song about this, and I'm hoping that you can... Uh, you can resonate with some of these as I have. So Psalm 73 says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. That always hits me. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come inequity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, people will turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree or free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Right. Yes. See, the man of God is struggling right here, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. man of God is struggling with the sacrifices he has made to live with a pure heart and then seeing other people yeah. have such an easy life. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have felt like when you sacrifice for God, things got harder? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Challenges came more. Yeah. Right? So this is a place for me. This is a real place for me where I can struggle. Yeah. I can wrestle. Verse 15. If I had spoken out like this, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Mm -hmm. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Yeah. Then I understood their final destiny. Brothers and sisters, there's a bigger picture that we got to grab a hold of when we look at those who have carefully free lives. Mm -hmm. Those that have so much so that we can check our own hearts about envy. There's a bigger picture we need to see. Number one, in the scriptures it talked about how they were fattened for the day of slaughter. Yeah. Right. There is a real judgment coming. Yes, sir. Right. And Jesus talked about money and judgment more than anybody else. And that's because those are real things. There's a reason why you're sitting here this morning. And there's a reason why we all need to reach for somebody else. Because there is a judgment coming and Jesus is coming back. Is that a reality for you? It had to be a reality for our brothers and sisters in the book of James. Because it's not like there was going to be an equity plan back then. They were oppressed and beat down, and the only thing they had was Jesus. That's right. That's right. 
They had to lean on their faith in the Lord and they had to trust in this verse over here. It's Romans 12, 19, when it says, The wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is, is mine. I will repay, yeah. says the Lord. That's right. That's right. If somebody needs to be repaid something, it's not from us. That's right. That's right. It's from the Lord. That's right. And one of the reasons for that is he's the one that has the full picture. Yeah. Right. Right. Come on. right? Yeah. We're clouded by our sin. We're clouded by our own temptation to hate. Yeah. Our own temptation to be bitter yeah. and selfish. Yeah. There might be some people you need to reach out to and love because they're an enemy. That's right. We got to love our enemies. That's right. We got to do good to those who mistreat us. Yeah. Might need to open up about that and talk to somebody. Exactly. You know, next week's lesson will kind of get into unpacking a bit more how we wait during that time of struggles and challenges and trials and oppression. But one thing we all know from this lesson is we got to be surrendered right. to God's will. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now, you may say to yourself, well, what about, because is God, if that's how people are when they have everything, is there, is there a healthy way to have some money? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, there's got to be some good news around there about money, right? Well, you know, money's just a tool for God. It's just a tool. That's what he's always teaching us, to see it as a tool and not as something that we need to love. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? We need to love God. We use money. Right? But, you know, something interesting in the scriptures in another verse here. We don't have time to kind of go through everything, but I'll say this. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, if you take a look and reflect on that a little bit later, the Ephesian church had some tribe because it had some wealthy members, yeah. right? And Paul gave some specific directions for Timothy to give to those wealthy members because they had wealth, but they weren't necessarily using it in a godly way. And so he gave some specific directions. He said, command those. That's a pretty intense word, isn't it? Command Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. In other versions, it says arrogant, right? Not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us riches and all things to enjoy. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Amen. So one thing during, towards this holiday season is that we have a lot of opportunity to give. Yeah. Where you are at in your wealth is, you got to look at it more as kind of relative to where you're at, right? Like, you may not have much in an American context, but you may have a whole lot considering a country in a, in a third world. Yeah. Right? My wife and I got to visit Bogota, Colombia when we were dating, and kids could not go to school regularly. You had to pay for that. And they were living in houses on the edge of a hill with dirt floors and no plumbing, no school, and we got an opportunity that really helped the humility of our hearts. Because yeah. we brought them shoes. Mm -hmm. And they were just happy to have a class. Wow. Right? Wow. But that doesn't mean that people aren't struggling here in America. Right. Yeah. It doesn't mean that there aren't needs here in America. But what God would want us to do with this opportunity is not be like the rich oppressors. Right? Because we got Jesus. So with Jesus, we should see our opportunities with what we have to be generous and willing to share and to be rich in good deeds. So these are things that can call us forward right. and help us have an amazing holiday season. Yes. You know, uh, Maggie's been putting out uh, things that we can do. You can see some bags in the back, you know, for some kiddos that we're trying to do. You can see that right after service. I uh, encourage you to talk to Maggie Conn. Raise your hand there, Maggie Conn, just in case you want to get involved. Give them a round of applause. Trying to help. You know, this is something where we can be rich in good deeds, right? But we're not limited to that. There are opportunities and there is good that God is putting on my heart and your heart to do. Right here and now today and in the future. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer for communion. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much.
uh, that your son will return. Uh, thank you so much that you want us to spend our time loving you and loving each other. Father, that your grace will help us do that. Thank you that you give us gifts. Thank you that you teach us and you're patient with us. Father, I just pray during communion that you help us reflect. Reflect on all you have given to us. And help us see clearly how you want us to give to others. Right. Father, we pray all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.